2019, and we're going to be dealing again with the subject for the next several weeks, Grace for the Winning Church, the Body of Christ. We are the winning team, we're the winning church, praise the Lord. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and we know anytime Jesus builds something, it has to win. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. There is no failure when Jesus builds something. So grace for the winning church, the body of Christ. Scripture we've been looking at is Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 from the New Living Translation. And it says Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the first of all who arise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Grace for the winning church, the body of Christ. Let's look at my introduction again. It says that when many people begin evaluating and looking at what makes a winning and successful church, they normally only look at the visible flesh of the church. They only look on the outside. This includes, they look at how big a church is. If a church is big, it must be a winning church. They look at uh, how many members that church has. If the church has many members, that means to them it is a winning and successful church. They look at how long uh, the church has been in existence. If the church has been around 50, 100, 200, 300 years, it must be a winning and successful church. They look at who attends that church. If certain dignitaries and certain people in the community attend that church, then they, to them that means that church is a winning church or a successful church. And my friends, there's nothing wrong with these things. There's nothing wrong with having many members and we believe God, that God can be bringing people from the east, the north, the south, and the west. There's nothing wrong by having people from all walks and sorts of life, people from various races, cultures, diversified. That's what we're believing in God. There's nothing wrong with a church being into existence a long time. We believe the house of faith will continue to be on praise the Lord for many, many years. And those are great things. But those things, listen to me, in themselves, does not necessarily mean that the church will be a winning church or a successful church. You see, my friends, many people fail to look at the internal aspects that makes the church work properly. For beneath the surface of this is a foundation that people don't really know about. Our above text states that the church is a body. Hallelujah. And we must look closely to its anatomy. Every physical body, hear me now, every physical body has certain features. We understand every body, every physical body, any anatomy has a head. But also, listen, it has a skeleton. It has eternal systems. It has muscles. And it has flesh. That's what your anatomy consists of. Likewise, a church, which is the body of Christ, needs to have a framework, a skeleton, a foundation. It needs to have eternal systems, which are certain attitudes. A church must have muscles, which are the different functions. And then the church must have a flesh, which is the form of the program. Because the church is the body or the anatomy of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Our first scripture testifies to this fact that the church is the body of Christ. It is the anatomy. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm just about to find that something in, all right? I mean, if I didn't get it, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. I'll let you read it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The church is 
the body. One church. One body. Many parts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Someone has that for us. We're going to read that and praise the Lord. Who has that for us? First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. All right. Go ahead. All right. We got it? Okay. We'll let you read it since you stand and I'll read it again. All right. Okay. It says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. One body, many parts. Just like in your body, you have a skeleton. You have internal organs. You have muscles. You have a skin. All of that, it composed many parts, but one particular body that you have. And so we've been teaching about the foundation. And so we were looking at, on last time, what is the foundation? What is the framework of your physical body? What is that thing that holds everything together? And we call it your skeleton. If I say skeleton. Yeah, skeleton. Now, the skeleton is so vital for several reasons. Number one, if you did not have a skeleton, you will be all over the place. You'll be just like a big blob. So what does the skeleton do? The skeleton is the foundation. It holds your entire body together. What also about skeleton? Although we have a skeleton, we cannot see it with the naked eye. Okay? Number three, the skeleton, if parts are missing in your skeleton, you will feel it. Anybody had a broken bone before? Anybody had a... That thing went through your entire body, right? So if something is missing within the skeleton, or something is fractured, something is severe, it will affect the entire body. So just as your physical skeleton is a foundation, everyone has one, it holds everything together, and if it's not working, you will feel it. So likewise, within the church, there are foundational truths that it must be intact, intact because if it's not there, guess what? It's going to affect the entire body of the church. If it's not there, guess what? You will feel it. And although you may not see it, but still, it is a vital force what? to hold the church together. Foundation called the skeleton. We call it the backbone. We call it that framework. We call it that which is necessity to hold you together. Praise the Lord. So what is the skeleton? Again, the skeleton in the physical body, it has to have some structure. The skeleton in vertebrate animals is what gives them the structure. Likewise, there are certain skeleton and foundation truths that a church has to be committed to. And these foundational truths are non-negotiable and cannot be compromised in any way if we're going to be the winning church. How many want to be a part of the winning church? Hallelujah. Well, the church is the body of Christ. So if my body has to win, the foundation or the skeleton has to be intact. And these are foundational truth. Although you cannot see it with your natural eye, but it will hold you together. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. You know, people say, I'm just falling to pieces. Oh, my life is just falling to pieces. Why? Because the structure is not working. There's something wrong in the foundation. So we want to deal with, again with foundation. On the last time we dealt with it, we look at one foundation of truth. And this is, number one, that if you're going to have a skeleton, we stated that there must be a correct biblical concept of God. A correct biblical concept of God. If a person does not have a correct concept of God, a view of God, then what happens is there's something wrong with their foundation. 
If they believe that God is mad at them. If they believe that God is holding grudges against them. If they believe that God is causing things to happen in their lives. If they believe that God is holding them back. See, if they believe that, that's a biblical or non-biblical view. And it's a foundation and it will affect everything in their lives. They go to a problem. God's trying to teach me a lesson. God is trying to punish me. God doesn't love me anymore. All of these things are foundational truths. So today we want to look at number two. What is the second foundation truth that the church must possess if it's going to be a successful and winning church? We all want to win, right? I said we all want to win, right? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. You just can't show up and expect to win. There's got to be some foundation. Things that people don't even see. But it's working all the time. Hallelujah. So here's number two. The second foundation truth to the body of Christ is obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ. <laughs> obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ. If a person does not have obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ, watch this, they will not be a part of the winning church. Now, the name may be on the road. Come on, somebody. And they may say, I'm a member of that church. But the question is, are they winning? Are they winning in their spiritual life? Are they winning in their physical life? Are they winning in their financial life? Are they winning in their emotional life? Are they winning in their relationship? Are they winning in their mind? Are they really truly winning? And if they're not, it may be because they have tried to compromise the obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ. So it's not just joining the church, it's joining Jesus. And you can join the church without joining Jesus, my friends. And I'll tell you, you have problems in being a part of the winning church. And people will live a defeated life. Things are always happening to them. Nobody loves them. Things are not working. They're behind on their bills and their dreams. They got sickness in their bodies all the time. Nobody loves them. They make excuses and they can't get ahead. What has happened? It may go back to the foundation. Have they made the commitment to be obedient to the ministry of Jesus Christ? Now, let's look at the ministry of Jesus Christ. The earthly ministry of Jesus Christ was threefold. Threefold. If Jesus was not sleeping, if he was not eating, if he was not in the presence of his Father, every time Jesus was doing one of these three things, every time, every time, study, all right? What does it consist of? It consists of teaching, preaching, and healing. That's it. How can I summarize the life of Jesus, his ministry? It was devoted to teaching, to preaching, and to healing. Say that. Teaching, <laughs> preaching, preaching, and healing. Yeah. Say it again. Teaching, teaching preaching, preaching, and healing. Yeah. That was his life. Every time we read about him, again, unless he was praying, spending time with his father, or unless he was sleeping, or unless he was eating, take away that. It's summarized in three things. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Hallelujah. And so if we're going to be a part of the winning church, come on somebody, a foundation truth of our church must be a church that's devoted to the ministry of Jesus Christ so we are devoted to teaching, preaching, and healing. That's it. Hallelujah. Summarize house of faith. Preaching, teaching, and healing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Pastor, what is your life about? I'm teaching, I'm preaching, and I'm healing. Unless I'm eating, go to sleep. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm, my I'm, I'm teaching, I'm preaching, I'm healing. So let's break this down. Let's look at this right here. Number one, let's deal with teaching. Number one says this, that people were amazed by Jesus Christ because he taught with authority. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. First, we'll look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Let's go ahead and go and deal with this right here. And then we'll get to the teaching part. 
Your Bible says, and he went throughout all the Galilee, watch this, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and he had every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people, demonstrating and revealing that he was indeed the promised Messiah. He was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing. So, here it is. Jesus, he comes to earth. He's born in a manger. So we hear about his birth. We hear about all the things that transpire. And then the Bible jumps from his birth to age 12. And at 12, the Bible says that he's in the temple, both asking and answering questions. And then his mother and father look for him. And they come back and they said, Jesus, why are you treating us, treating us this type of way? And at 12 years old, this is what Jesus says. Did you not know I had to be about my father's business? And then for 18 years, we hear nothing. Then at age 30, Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible says when he comes out of the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then after that, the Bible says Jesus is led in the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And after this temptation, we see Jesus. He begins his ministry and he calls his disciples. And after he calls his disciples, his ministry takes off. And again, this is what his ministry was about. In verse 23, that Jesus went through all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people demonstrating, revealing that he was indeed the promised Messiah. He was teaching, preaching, and healing. Amen? Amen. Say it again. Teaching, teaching, teaching preaching, 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 and healing. And, healing. And, healing. I, and I want you to see this, you know, because people say, well, 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 what is your life about? What is your life about as a Christian? Hey, I am teaching, preaching, and I'm healing. Amen. Everything else is secondary. Praise the Lord. And I'm obedient, and that's a foundation. That's what's going to hold me together. So let's go to number one again, teaching. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. Look at this teaching. Now, when you're teaching, you are given instructions. Now, notice something about Jesus teaching. He says, when this is after his sermon on the mount, it says, when Jesus has finished saying these things, watch this, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Now, Jesus' teaching was so prolific that your Bible says that the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why was that? Because he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. So Jesus' teaching, this your outline says this, shows a concern for understanding, uh, uh, understanding. Jesus' teaching was not based upon the tradition and wisdom of men but by the indwelling and leading of the Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit. Why were they amazed at his teaching? Why? Because he taught with authority. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. He taught with authority. Well, Pastor, how is he able to teach with authority? He taught with authority because the Father gave him the authority. I want you to hear this now. He gave him authority. Why? Because Jesus was the Word. Yes. <laughs> you can right now. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. Come on. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And whenever you got the Word in you, and whenever you are the Word, praise the Lord, listen, the Word comes with authority. He was the living word. He was the spoken word. He had authority. And so the Father gave him authority. Now let me give you a scripture that you don't have. Look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. 18 and 19. Let me show you something right here about this authority. See, the people were amazed. They were astonished at his teaching. Because, listen, he just didn't teach what he uh, learned. He taught what he was. Let me say this again. He didn't teach what he learned. The seminary didn't teach him. Bible school didn't teach him. He taught who he was. He was the word. He was the authority. So he only gave what he had. He stood on the word which he was, and that word has authority. And then he says in verse 18, and Jesus came his face and said, listen, all authority. Come on now. See, when you have all authority, guess what? It's going to amaze the folk around you. You're going to get people attention. They're going to be excited and say, where did you come from? We don't know about you. You never went to Bible school. You never went to seminary. What happened? What happened? Listen, you realize that the father I have didn't start with me. It came from my father. He endowed in me. He downloaded his authority in me. So he says, all authority has given to me, what? In heaven and in earth. Yes, amen. Amen. Now watch this. Here's the part I like it. Since I have authority, now here's your assignment. You go. Yeah. You go. Yeah. Why? Because you now have authority. Listen, I give you, uh, 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 what's that legal word they call power of attorney? I think the power of attorney, which means it's a legal right for me to conduct business on your behalf yeah. as though you are there. I want to tell you a house of faith. Praise the Lord. You've got to realize that you have authority. Say this, I have authority. Look at what I say, you have authority. Praise the Lord. And when you walk in your authority, glory to God, that Jesus has given to you, people are going to be astonished. They're going to be amazed. When you talk, glory, it's not going to be your words, but it will be authoritative words that will take over their situation. They'll take over their deliverance. They'll take over their problem. They'll take over their circumstances. Glory to God. And they say, well, I feel so much better. They say, what's in you? Praise the Lord. You say, you need to know who gave what's in me. It's a man by the name of Jesus.
mean, I was just buying some items in the store. And uh, this lady just came out of the blue, just said this to me. And I mean, it just kind of took me. She says, are you here because you're here? Or are you here because the Lord sent you to me? And I'm looking at my eyes and I'm like, huh? Are you here because you're here, but did the Lord send you to me? And then the thought of Jesus just rose up in and I said, the Lord has a word for you today. And that word is, don't quit. Don't give up. The Lord never gave up on you, so you don't give up on me. Amen. And she just looked at me. And I haven't seen her since. Please. See, people will recognize, listen, when you're obedient to the Jesus Christ and teaching, and you're, you're devoted to his instructions, they'll recognize there's something inside of you that's not normal. Right. Listen, it's not natural. It's supernatural. Yeah. <clears throat> you're there on that job. You're there in that business. You're there in that, in that not because of something natural. It's supernatural. Is God's super has come upon your natural, yes. and they will be amazed and astonished at your authority. Hallelujah. And you don't have to walk around and blow your tooth your horn, and they'll know it. <laughs> Jesus didn't go around walking around. They know it. They just say, you know, just, this is something different about you, Jesus. See, you're not like the scribes and the religious people. See, they had to go to to learn to try to be something. You knew who you already were. People recognize that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, let's go back to Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 28. Something else I want to share with you. He says, when Jesus has finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Now I'm looking at this right here and I say, okay, Jesus, I understand that you had authority. Is it something else that when you taught, the people became amazed and astonished of how you taught? I understand you had an authority, but what also some other things that were different between when you said something and religion said something. Why, why, why did people gravitate to you all the time? Why did you preach to multitudes? What was it about you that people wanted to be around you, that they wanted to be associated with you? But they wanted just to be in your presence. What was so unique about you, Jesus, that was different from religion? And I want you to hear me now. Hear me. And this is what's going to make you have authority as well. And, and, and it's going to be so awesome. When the people, listen, when the people heard Jesus teach, Three things came to their mind. This is what they said. I'm using the everyday vernacular. This guy, he's real. This guy is relatable. And this guy is relative to what I'm facing. He's like one of us. We can relate to what he's talking about. What he's saying is not just a bunch of big words, but he, he, he's, he is relative. He, 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 he's, he's on our level. We understand what he's talking about. And guess what? He is so genuine. He is so real. He is not phony. And the people who are used to religious guys coming around and like they're up here and the people down here. It's like they, they said some stuff, but they didn't seem real. They were superficial. You ever been around phony people before? 
Y'all ever been around for a while? Maybe y'all. People who are not real. People when you talk to, they were not relatable. People who were not relative to what they were going through. And so they like, we've never seen anybody like this. That he talked on our level. He talked about things that mean something to us. And because he was like that, he now has a place to get into our circle. He, he, we can relate to him and now we can open up and share some things with him because, watch this, he has our best interest at all. Now, I want you to write these three words down somewhere. And I have used these for several, several years when I'm talking to people. Because when I am talking to people, I want to be real, I want to be a relative, and I want to be related to people. I want to relate to what they did with. And I want you to write these three words. And I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to show you a scripture that backs it up about Jesus. And why Jesus, when he taught, people became amazed at what he taught. I want you to write these three words down. I want you to write the word feel, F-E-E-L, felt, F-E-L-T, and found, F-O-U-N-D. Feel, felt, and found. Feel, felt, and found. If I say feel, feel. felt, felt. And, found. and found. And I'm going to show you when you use these words correctly that when you're talking to people, they're going to see that you're real, you're relatable, and you're relevant. And this is how I use these three words. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is I, but this is what I found. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. Well, Pastor, is that scripture? I'm gonna give you a scripture to show it to me. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and verse 16. I'm talking about when you're talking to people, we're still talking about teaching. Because you can teach people individually. You don't always have to be standing for like I'm doing. You can teach people one-on-one. -on -one. Feel, felt, and found. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, verse 16. And I'm going to show you why Jesus had so much authority. Why people were astonished at his doctrine. Yes, he had the Holy Spirit. Yes, he, 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 yes, he had authority so much. But people were astonished at his teaching. Why, why was that he so relatable? Why he was so relevant? Why people want to be around him? Because he used the three uh, feel, felt, and found. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, verse 16. It says, this high priest, talking about Jesus, of ours, watch this, understands our weakness. He understands how we feel. Watch this. For he faced all of the same testings as we do. He said, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. Watch this. Yet he did not sin. He says, yeah, I know how you feel. I understand you. I felt the same way because I faced the same tests as you did. But this is what I found. 
I did not see. I found something different. I did not see. And then it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace of God, that we may receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need the most. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. So I'm talking to a person. And I'm just using an example. Let's say, for example, they're going through a death in their family. I'm talking about how you teach people. I'm talking about how people will gravitate you and they'll be so amazed and astonished when every time you talk. Okay? You're not just flapping your guns. You're not just going for They see the realness in you. They see that you're genuine. They see that you can relate and they see that you're relative to the things. And let's say a person lost a loved one. And as you don't know, uh, my mother passed away when I was 15 years old. In 1972. And so now, let's say, for example, they live a loved one. And so I can go to them and say, I know how you feel. I know the pain. I know the hurt. I know the disappointment. Because this is how I feel. I felt the same way. I felt lonely. I felt I would have to make through life by myself. So I felt the same way. I understand what you're going through. But don't forget the third part. But this is what I found. That although my mother's gone, God has brought me several other mothers. And my life is never be the same. Amen. See? This is how I feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. Let's use another example. Let's say a person who has some financial difficulties. And they talk to you and they say, you know what? I'm just struggling. I use the same three process. I know how you feel. I know how you feel about, you know, not having enough money to pay your bills. I know how you feel having more money than you have money. I felt the same way. I felt that I wasn't going to be able to make it. I felt it was going to be hard to struggle all my life. But this is what I found. That I started using God's principles and put them in line and guess what? Money is no longer an issue for me. You see how you're teaching people? This is how I feel. See, instead of you going, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Ooh, see, see, Jesus didn't never do that way. But some of us, we run around, we run people away. Well, you shouldn't feel this way. You ought to be like I am. See, they're not ready for that. You got to be able to be real, you got to be relative, and you got to relate to says, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. You are now teaching wealth authority. And people will be as astonished and amazed. They said, you know what? I found a Christian that was real. I found a Christian who didn't judge me. You know, I, I found a Christian, you know, who, who understands the things they're going through. Maybe they got a sin in some of their life. Well, you need to get out of that sin. See, they don't need to hear that. You need to tell them, you know what? I know how you feel. I know how you feel to get in sin. It's not a pleasant feeling. Why? I felt the same way. I felt that I left God down. I felt like I could never make it. I felt that God will, will, will judge me for the rest of my life. I felt that same way. But this is what I found. I found that Jesus loves me. Amen. Yes. And that God is not holding my sins against me. That because he judged Jesus, he would never have to judge me again. This is how I know how you feel. I felt the same way, but this is what I found. Say this, I know how you feel. I felt the same way, but this is what I found. Praise the Lord. Turn to someone on your left and the right, because y'all know I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. Praise the Lord. Look at somebody say, friend. I know how you feel. 
I felt the same way. I felt the same way. But, this but this is what I found. I want to tell you, you start, you start talking to people like that, oh, I want to tell you, they're going to follow you everywhere you go. What happens? You are not exercise the authority that Jesus has given you. That's what he did. He dealt with our weakness. He definitely says. He understands our weakness. Some of us, I mean, we think we're so holy, we can't understand folk anymore. Well, you should have did. See, you wasn't always like where you are. Amen. Have you forgotten where you come from? Have you forgotten the stuff that you had to deal with in your life? Those things that you didn't tell anybody about? Jesus says, I understand your weakness. I understand it's hard to give up that habit that you've been doing for 10, 20, 30 years. I understand that. For I face the same testings that you do. What? But this is what I found. You don't have to sin unless you want to. Amen. What? You have a right not to sin. I do? Yeah. See, this is what I found. Praise the Lord. And when you start teaching people and teaching people and dealing with the things in their lives that you have, whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's in relationship, whether it's in their minds, whatever it is, whatever those things, you give folk like that, I want to tell you, they will gravitate to you. Because I said, I find a thousand Christians who are not going to judge me. Because I found out that Ronnie Simmons is not all that. Now you may be all that. I ain't. Excuse my bodies. <laughs> I know how you feel. Amen. I felt the same way. But this is what I found. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go to number two. The second part of Jesus' ministry, not only was teaching, but it was preaching. Jesus came on the scene preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14, verse 15. Hallelujah. See, this got to be a truth. See, see, a lot of people in church, they don't know this. They wonder why they're not winning. They wonder why they're struggling all the time. You've got to be obedient to the teachings of Jesus and follow his teachings, and you're part of the winning church. Hallelujah. He's going to back you up all the time. So let's look at preaching. Preaching is proclaimed. All right? Now notice verse 14 and verse 15 says this. Now after John the Baptist was arrested and uh, taken into custody, watch this, Jesus went into Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the appointed period of time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, change your inner self, your own way of thinking, regret past sins, Live your life in a way that proves repentance. See God's purpose for your life and believe with a deep abiding trust in the good news regarding salvation. That was his message. He came not only teaching and instructing, but he became proclaiming a message. And the message was the kingdom of God. Yeah. Hallelujah! Now, the kingdom of God is the, the rulership of God. Matthew 6.33 says, First seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added un, un, unto us. So the kingdom of God is God's ruling us. It is his system of operation. It's what he does and how he does it. That's in his kingdom. You have the kingdom of this world, and then you have the kingdom of God. We are in this world, but we're not what? Of this world. We are of the kingdom of God. God rules us. Amen. Self doesn't rule us. God rules us. And you watch everything going on in the news today, it has to deal with self. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Me, what I think, what I know, no, no, it's not. It's what God says. Yes. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you tell me what God said, get ready for the ridicule. Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear what God, the kingdom of God, they want themselves to crown themselves as God. Now, I want to go to something here, and I want to share something with you. Praise the Lord. I get so excited about this. I'm like, oh, Lord, God. Praise the Lord. 
the Lord. I want to tell you, I just love teaching and preaching the word of God. It, woo, my, 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 my. It is so awesome. Because I, I see how things are working. Praise the Lord. And guess what? When I do this, I'm on the winning side. How do you like to win? Praise the Lord. Now watch this. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and said the appointed period of time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Watch this. Repent. Change your inner self. Notice your old way of thinking. Oh my goodness. Regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose. Watch this. For your life. The reason why I preach the way it is because I want to let you know that God created you on purpose and secondly, He created you for a purpose. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, I, listen, I may not be the sharpest tool in the, in the shed, but if I got a preacher who's going to tell me I was created on purpose and created for a purpose, I want to hear about it. Amen. I got to realize that, listen, my life is more than from nine to five. And we did. It's got to be something more than life. There's got to be a stronger purpose. Praise the Lord. But it only can come through the preaching of the gospel. The good news. Hallelujah. For my life. And believe with a deep abiding trust in the good news regarding salvation. Now, I want to deal with this word repentance. Because uh, oftentimes when we think about repentance, which is true, we only think about <coughs> repentance from our sins. And that is so necessary. I, I, I need to change my mind when it comes to sin. I really need to realize that it's when I have a right not to sin. I understand that. But the word repentance also means, it, it's something a little deeper than that. Because I like what it says is, it says, your old way of thinking. Your old way of thinking. So evident that there's a God way of thinking, and then there's my way of thinking. And your Bible says, I need to change the way I think. And watch this. Unless I change the way I think, I'm not truly repenting. I want you to hear this now. Okay? Well, I'm just sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, we know you're sorry. What's your mom <laughs> it's not just I'm sorry. It's just my thinking about things have to change. And so my old way of thinking is not working. Okay? My old way of thinking about my body is not like working. My old way of thinking about my finances is not working. The old way of thinking about relationships is not working. The old way of thinking about my emotions. It's not working. The only way I think about relationships, it's not working. So guess what? I've got to change the way I think about these things. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It's not working. You know, it's amazing when people come to me and, you know, they tell about some stuff and all, and they've been doing it, and I've been telling them. I ask them, I say, tell me, how's that been working out for you? I say, is it working? I say, I've been working. Keep on doing it. I'm not going to criticize you. If it works, you're going to do it. I said, but if you're still frustrated, there's some things you're going to need to change. And here's the thing. Your circumstances won't change until your thinking changes. Amen. See, many times, we're trying to change people's circumstances without changing their thinking. And you can't get a person that's saying $50 over and over again and pay that circumstance check, you will go broke. And they're thinking, never say say. Pastor, you mean you, you're just giving people money? No, I'm not just giving money. But guess what? I'm going to give some also thinking to be changed. Because not that they'll be back next week. And I'm going to tell you, I am not their God and I'm not the Holy Spirit. Amen. But that thinking has to be changed. Y'all still love me? We just, we, I'm talking about this is preaching. Maybe this is why people don't like coming to church. Because they're going to tell the truth they're preaching. And it's going to change their lives. And they've been fooled to think they can continue to do the same thing over again and things will get better. This thing will get worse for them. Praise the Lord. So, what are the words for repent? And I'm going to do some study. And it's interesting. Half, 
this highly changed our thinking is we have to go back to the original intent of something. True repentance means also to go back to the original intent of what God thinks about me. And once I understand what God thinks about me and start doing those things, I see repentance taking a hold of me. And what has happened? Watch this now. I am now receiving the gospel of the kingdom of God. So let's go back to the original intent. Repent me, because the word re is a, is a, is, is a prefix means to go back. It's to do again. So we need to go back to what was God's intent for us. I'm glad you asked. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 28. Oh my, this is going to be so good. Preach it. Pastor Ray always talking about people being healed and talk about people being well and people being financially off and, and people having good emotions and, and, and people getting to hear. Why y'all be preach that back away? Because I'm preaching repentance. Because if you don't understand the original intent, what God made you for, you'll miss everything. And this is where we go back. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, verse 28. You have to say amen. Amen. Watch this. Then God says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over creeping things that creeps on the earth. So, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God made both male and female equal. I want you to understand this now. This is God's vision of it. It was never, never God's original tip for man to be up here and woman to be here. I want you to understand that now, all right? I want you to get this. They were supposed to be equal. Now, they had different responsibilities, different positions, and I understand that. But I'm just reading the Word of God. Yeah. Amen? I'm talking about, let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Before sin came in. All right? Because Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, the good news. Go back to the original intent. Well, I'm going to make some preachers mad at me today. <laughs> Especially don't believe in women preach. They don't as mad at me. Amen. But I'm just teaching the word. Amen. Now watch verse 28. Then God blessed them. That word bless means to empower, to prosper. It means to, 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 uh, 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 to succeed. It really means to win. So God blessed them. Watch this. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Yeah. Now, my friends, if you don't remember anything else, you've got to write these five things down. Because once you get a revelation of this, this will change your life. You will now discover that God made you on purpose and he made you for a purpose. Yes. When you understand this, I want to tell you, you never will have another depressed day. I didn't say depression won't try to come on you, but listen, you won't be walking around depressed. You won't be walking around defeated. You won't be walking around any type of way because now you understand that the message of Jesus was to preach good news. Everybody say good news. Good news. And everybody, we want to hear good news, right? Yeah. So the good news is knowing that God made me on purpose and he made me for a purpose. And here's my purpose. Look at verse 28, five things. I ought to be fruitful. I ought to multiply. I'm going to fill the earth. I'm going to subdue it, and I'm going to have to meet you. Five things why God made you. Woo, my, 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 my. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. All right, let's look at this. 
Number one, to be fruitful. The word fruitful here means to duplicate. This morning when I came here, I gave a copy of this message. And I said, I need X amount of copies made. I need for you to duplicate the original. All right? And the person did it. Now, can you tell the difference? All of these are copies. Can you tell the difference between your copy and your neighbor's copy? Hmm? So we really don't know who has the original. Glory to God. Because the copies look just like the original. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so when God says, I want you to be fruitful, he says, I want you to duplicate yourself so much that they can't tell who's the original or ever Fitzgerald says, who, who was that number X or who's the original. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Is an original is a duplication. Be fruitful means, in a sense, duplicate yourself. Just like in an apple. An apple has seeds. And those seeds are there because when you plant those seeds, it duplicates and it makes more apples. And I say this, I want you to write this down if you can. Man can count the amount of seeds in an apple. Man can count the amount of seeds in an apple, but only God can count the amount of apples in a seed. Let me say it again. Man can count the number of seeds in an apple, but only God can count the amount of apples in a seed. So when you are fruitful, you are duplicating yourself. The God that's inside of you, you're duplicating yourself. Praise the Lord. And your eye goal is to look more like Jesus, to be fruitful. And we want to look more like Jesus. And when people see the Jesus inside of you, then they'll duplicate that. And guess what? They'll be like a Jesus. And they'll be like a Jesus. And they'll be like a Jesus. And guess what? It won't just be a people who just come to church. We all look like Jesus. And we'll perform like Jesus did. We are not being fruitful. Yes. That's what your life is. Your life is to duplicate yourself into somebody else. And you thought it was only for your children. But no, 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 my friends. You are to duplicate yourself. You see, now like Jesus wants us to look like him. Because when we duplicate ourselves, then now people start looking like Jesus. Like we did. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So now I know when people make me mad and I duplicate Jesus, I rather go cuss him out. Good Jesus, when they made him mad, he didn't cuss anybody out. Yo, yo, yo. Can I take the time to preach this up here? Yes. Child, don't let my room. Don't let the real me come out on me. It is. Oh my goodness. I thought the real you was like Jesus. Don't let me show myself. Oh, I want to see yourself. <laughs> are you more human or are you more like Jesus? Because we all come from the same seed. Yeah. Hallelujah! And the seed is on death to be duplicated. Amen. Number two, you multiply. Multiply just simply means to increase. It needs to expand. Glory to God. And I want to tell you, man of God, woman of God, listen, you've got the spirit of increase on you. Everything around you is supposed to be increasing. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. That's why I thank God for the spirit of increase. Increase in my body. Increase in my mind. Increase in my spirit. Increase in my finances. Increase in my love walk. Increase in the fruits of the spirit. Increase! We serve the God of increase. Yes, Hallelujah! So therefore, I will multiply, increase, expand. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Number three, I'll fill the earth. To fill the earth means to bring things into its completeness. Bring things in, in its completeness. 
or bring things to full satisfaction. When I am filling the earth, I am bringing things to its completeness, its fullness, and I'm bringing things to satisfaction. See, there are so many people today who are dissatisfied.
They're hurting. They're hurting financially, emotionally, socially, emotionally, with their children and everything else. And they need to have to touch. Something about you when you touch people. When you hold them by the hand and let them know, hey, it's going to be okay. I believe in you. I know it looks dark right now, but I want to tell you, listen, the light is coming. You're not going to this thing by yourself. I'm not going to let go of you. And you realize that the healing takes place. And when folk know that they heal, they know where it comes from, mm -hmm. they will gravitate you all the time. <laughs> all the time. And your healing is a result of your teaching and your preaching. I thank God that he used people to heal hurts ahead in my life, to make a difference. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I want to tell you, people need emotional healing today, y'all. Amen. <sighs> yeah. There's so much unforgiveness, so much animosity. People need to have the healing touch to let them know, hey, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. This is what I found. If Jesus could heal me of my hurts, he can heal you. So therefore, as we close, the miracles of healing are dedicated Jesus teaching and preaching, proving that he was truly from God. The threefold ministry of Jesus Christ is good news because it offers everyone freedom, hope, peace of heart, and eternal life with God. Everybody step to your feet. We have to be obedient to this ministry of Jesus Christ. Not just to church traditions, not just to religion, but obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we have to walk this thing out, ladies and gentlemen in the marketplace. We have to be teaching, teachers of the word. We have to be proclaimers, we preaching, proclaim the goodness of the people. And we have to be available to provide healing for people. Hurting people. We have to be able to touch the world one touch at a time. And the greatest thing people can say is, you know, thank you for touching my life. You made a difference in my life. See, that's you. Yeah, like I said, this is, I, I, believe, I believe God in the physical healing. I believe in laying on my hands. I believe in that. I truly believe that. I believe that by Jesus Christ who I heal. But it's not only just physical healing, it's other type of healing. Yeah. Amen. So don't ever think, when I'm not calling to heal people, oh yes you are. Your touch, your presence, your prayer, your availability. You can touch people's lives. One at a time. Remember, if you want to start to see change in your life, be the change in someone else's life. Amen. And you'll be blessed. Let's take our four confessions regarding obedience to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Number one, say this I confess, I confess that my obedience, my obedience to the teaching of, of Jesus Christ is not based upon the traditions or wisdom of being, but on the dwelling, leading of the Holy Spirit. I will have a concern for understanding. Understand. Number two is that I confess that my obedience to the preaching of Jesus Christ will lead me to the good news of the kingdom of God. I will be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and dominate. I will have a concern for commitment. Number three is that I confess that my obedience, my obedience to, the to the healing of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ will be demonstrated with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and with power. This demonstration will validate my preaching and teaching. And number four is I confess that this threefold ministry of Jesus Christ is good news because it's offered to everyone 
freedom, freedom hope, 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 peace of heart, peace of heart and, eternal and eternal life of God. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and take our prayer of commitment. Ready? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you enable me to be obedient to the threefold ministry of Jesus Christ. This threefold ministry of Jesus Christ, which involves teaching, preaching, and healing. I thank you that you have given me this good news because it offers to everyone freedom, hope, peace of heart, and eternal life with you. As I realize this, I understand that you have given me the grace for the winning team in 2019. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.